Jean Haney with the Maine Irish Heritage Center. I'm super excited today to be hosting our very first book talk, and what a great program it will be. We have the authors of Old Ireland in Color, Professor John G. Breslin and Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley with us. They are going to present a selection of images from their brand new book, which will be released in just a few short days in the USA. They'll delve into the historic significance of each image while also demonstrating how colorizing unveils new details. The book is evocative, mesmerizing, touching, and deeply moving as it covers Irish life from the early 1800s when photography was first introduced in Ireland through to the beginning of the Troubles, which Maine's own beloved Senator George Mitchell negotiated an end to, culminating in the Good Friday Agreement signed in 1998. We'll also hear from two esteemed historians specialized in Irish immigration to Maine across two centuries. With us today are Dr. Michael Connolly, author and professor emeritus in history and political science, and Matthew Jude Barker, the Maine Irish Heritage Center's own historian, as well as an author and genealogist. Just to give a quick overview of the program, we'll open with a short video from our genealogy department talking about the connections between the Connemara and Portland. Then Dr. Connolly and Matt Barker will speak to the history of the Irish in Maine. And after that, John Breslin and Sarah M. Buckley will treat us to more than a dozen images explaining their historic significance and pointing out details uncovered in the colorization process. At the end, we'll have a Q&A with all four experts. Throughout the talk, you can queue up your questions for any of them in the YouTube comments on your screen. To make it easy for us to pick out your questions from all the great conversations sparked by the program, please preface the question with a capital Q. We'll get to as many as we can. Hopefully, you have your coffee or tea ready and maybe some nice Irish soda bread. So sit back and enjoy the program. Who are you? Where are you from? What are the stories about your ancestors? Welcome to the Maine Irish Heritage Center's library, world-renowned keeper of keys that opens the doors to family stories, unsolved mysteries, and introductions to Irish relatives you never knew you had. The library's genealogy program welcomes you into a magical world where passionate and professional genealogists introduce you to volumes of books, family stories, and oral histories, drawers of amazing photographs, priceless historical and vital records, special collections, and state-of-the-art DNA testing. My name is Deb Jellerson. I've been volunteering here for about eight years, and the DNA project is called the Maine Galtech DNA Project. A large majority of the Irish in Portland are from the Galway area. Because of our uniqueness in our project and the fact that we have a database of family tree information with over 200,000 names, that we were one of the most unique and powerful DNA projects in the world. So we're very proud of our project. We've brought a lot of um, connections from Galway to Portland and vice versa. The Connemara, Ireland's largest Gielte, or Irish-speaking region, is the epicenter for our research. It is where Irish lives as the community language, where it has been spoken for over 2,000 years. Our volunteer genealogists know this magnificent part of Ireland very well. They are passionate detectives who search high and low for main connections, leaving no stone unturned. From the moment they step off the plane at Shannon Airport, they are quickly on the road traveling from one small town to another, relentlessly searching for clues in local cemeteries and neighborhood pubs, knocking on doors, until they finally meet the family they'd been searching for. Armed with a dozen DNA kits to test in the Connemara area, and of the 12 kits that we randomly tested, 10 of them had connections to the city of Portland, Maine. We, we randomly asked a waiter in a pub one night to, to DNA test, and he ended up being related to more people in the city of Portland, I think, than I am. 
Uh, um, the Maine Irish Heritage Center is very, very fortunate to have Maureen Coyne Norris and Margaret Feeney Lacombe here working in our genealogy program. They started the genealogy program here. They have been involved with the Maine Irish Heritage Center since its inception. And none of it would have been possible had they not had the enthusiasm and, and eagerness to bring Portland Irish into this building. We have a very active genealogy team here that meets on Fridays. We've done conferences both internationally and locally. And um, many, many classes have been held here. And we can't say enough good things about the number of hours and the dedication that these people have had. And if you are going to do anything for the Maine Irish Heritage Center in way of donating to um, family history, um, please do it in their names. They are, they are and have been the um, very key to what makes everything tick around here. The donation that we love is family trees, family histories. Um, we love your photographs and, you know, any old Bibles, any old yearbooks, any old, anything that's related to the Irish in Maine, we would, we would gratefully appreciate you bringing it in here. We also love old newspapers. If you're going through your homes and you have, um, you know, uh, any, any newspapers in the state of Maine from from way back, they, they become very valuable to genealogy research here. We can all tell you many stories about strangers that walk through the building and two hours later they leave, not only as a friend, but often as a cousin. American writer Madeline Engel wrote, if you don't recount your family history, it will be lost. Honor your own stories and tell them too. The tales may not seem very important, but they are what binds families and makes each of us who we are. Matt Barker, one of the genealogists here and, and resident historian. Yeah, we have such a miscellaneous collection of photographs too that have been donated. And no one, uh, unfortunately, a lot of them, there were no names on the back. So we don't know who they are. We're hoping someday to identify them. Who are you? Where are you from? And what are the stories about your ancestors? The Maine Irish Heritage Center Library can help. I'm Patsy Wiggins. Become a member and journey with us as we continue to build those all-important connections between who we are today and from where we came in Ireland. delighted to be joining the Maine Irish Heritage Centre for their very first uh, book talk. And what a book you have uh, chosen to kick off with. Um, this is a really, really wonderful book um, about Irish history. And I know that we are going to be joined by the authors, John Breslin and Sarah Ann Buckley. Um, so you are in for a real treat. Um, this is a, a history book about Ireland, but it's not just any Irish history book. It's something that's really unique and special because it is a book that takes a wonderful collection of photos spanning a really transformational period in Irish history. So spanning from the time that photography was first introduced in Ireland uh, in the early 1840s, right up till um, the late 1960s. So a really interesting period, transformational period in Irish history. So you got events and photos in this book covering everything from the Great Famine to the Land War, to the First World War, to rebellion, uh, civil war and, and beyond. And it takes these photos, uh, black and white photos and restores them meticulously to color images and the effect is really arresting. I've seen some of these images and I can tell you um, the effect is really stunning. It brings a sense of immediacy to the images 
and it reveals details that can be quite hard to see in black and white. So it's really, I would say, a really transformational effect on photos that are available um, from some of the wonderful collections in from public domain sources in places like the National Library, the National Folklore Collection, the National Library of Congress. But it takes them and puts them together and restores them in this wonderful way that really brings these images to life. And it's the book has had a, a really wonderful effect uh, in Ireland. I know it's really captured people's imagination because already, uh, you know, even before the book's been officially launched in the US, I understand it's it's being reprinted. So for anybody who has an interest in Irish history or a sense of connection with Ireland, as I know many of the people at the main Irish Heritage Centre Centre do, um, this is a really wonderful book and it'll be really wonderful to learn more about this period in Irish history and of course people uh, from, from these periods and their connections with, with Maine and with New England. Um, and it will be great to hear a bit more about that history and a bit more about the book and the making of it. So you're in for a real treat, as I said. So enjoy. And thanks very much. Welcome again to the Maine Irish Heritage Centre in Portland. Uh, my name is Mike Connolly, as you've heard, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Irish uh, immigration into Portland and uh, how they were connected here with the church and now the center. So um, as you all know, the, the great uh, famine or the great hunger, potato blight of the mid 19th century uh, had a profound effect on Ireland, but it had a profound, profound effect on us here in Portland as well. The Grand Trunk Railroad connected Portland with the much larger city of Montreal in Canada to the north in 1853. So this was just about three years after the end of the, the famine. What this meant for Portland was that for 70 years, from 1853 until about 1923, uh, Canadian grain came into Portland and was offloaded onto ships to the major ports of Europe. This uh, led to a great increase of labor along the waterfront, and many Irish longshoremen worked in the Portland uh, Longshoremen Benevolent Society. And I'll talk about that in just a second. There was, from the get-go, a very strong Galway connection. This church here, St. Dominic's, was started by uh, Reverend Charles French of Galway. He was a Dominican, and therefore the name St. Dominic's, way back in 1833. With the recurrence of the potato blight in 1879 to 82, there was another widespread immigration, largely from the west of Ireland. Uh, they feared that there could be another widespread famine. In 1880, for example, right in the midst of this, my grandmother and grandfather, Coleman from Califinish and Mary Joyce from Minish, uh, came over to Portland. In that same year of 1880, the Longshoremen Benevolent Society was formed and a lot of uh, Irish speakers worked on the waterfront. The gangs were often Gaelic speakers and my grandfather would have been very uh, comfortable in that kind of env environment. Longshore work, railroad work, digging of canals, other forms of construction were very, very common for the men. Domestic work or work in the hotels uh, and private work, uh, very common for the women. From the uh, 1880s until the 1920s, uh, many Irish from Galway in particular continued to come, chain migration, following those of an older generation. Dr. Ken Nilsson, uh, of Harvard and also St. Francis Xavier in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, studied the Irish speakers of Portland and came to the conclusion that perhaps on a per capita basis, Portland had more Irish speakers than any other city in North America. And I certainly think that this might have been true. In the mid 1980s, when Ken was introduced to these Irish speakers, there were at least 50 native speakers still living in Portland. Today, unfortunately, there are only two left, one from Ferbo in the, um, in the eastern edge of Kusharaga and one from Inverin in the western edge of Kusharaga. I'll conclude by talking a little bit about today. Of course, just to our south, 100 miles, the former mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, um, came from good Irish Connemara stock. His mother was from Rossmuck and his father from Califinish, the same townland that my grandfather hailed from. 
Here in Portland, uh, two notable uh, politicians, Governor Joe Brennan, uh, whose father came from Rashid Nemanja and mother came from Kalafinish, two-term governor and uh, also served in the U.S. House of Representatives. Also George Mitchell, who originally came from Irish and Lebanese stock, uh, and both of these, of course, George Mitchell, well known for his work in bringing peace to Northern Ireland. Both of these people were recipients of the CLADA Award, uh, the award that the Maine Irish Heritage Center gives for service to the Irish in Maine. St. Dominic's eventually became the Maine Irish Heritage Center, which it is today. And you can uh, get access to this by going on maineirish.com. You'll be very welcome when you do, and you'll hear a lot about the history of this place. You've heard about Matt Barker already and the work that he has done, both with the history of St. Dominic's and the history of the Irish in Maine. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thanks for being with us. Good afternoon, my name is Matthew Jude Barker. I'm one of the genealogists and historians at the Maine Irish Heritage Center. I have a personal connection to St. Dominic's with my uh, Irish immigration to Maine started in the 1720s uh, with Scots, Irish Presbyterians, and Irish Catholics. The Irish Catholics were outlawed here in Maine, which was a part of Massachusetts. So they kept their heads low, they quietly worked, and they fought in the local militia in the French and Indian Wars. And uh, they often married local Protestant women and disappeared into the heterogeneous culture of Yankeedom. The earliest Irishman in southern Maine that we know of, or one of the earliest, and the first in Portland, was uh, Thaddeus Tighe Clark. He was, his name was Tighe, the name was anglicized it to Thaddeus. And he was here in 1662, married uh, the granddaughter of one of the founders of Portland. But basically the, the Irish immigration in the Maine started in the 1720s and ended in the 1920s, there was 200 years, 200 years of, of constant immigration. Uh, the biggest immigration, however, didn't start till the 1820s. Uh, the Catholic Irish settled in Damascot, Newcastle in the 1780s and 1790s. They were from County Kilkenny and County Waterford. These Irishmen and their families uh, created and started St. Patrick's Church in, in Newcastle, which was built in 1808 and uh, now is the oldest stand-in active Catholic church in, in New England and the Northeast. Many Irish, scattered Irish, a lot of them came individually from uh, Canada, even from Newfoundland to Maine, and they lived all along the Maine coast, such as Limerick-born John Fitzgerald, veteran of the Revolution, who, as I found out, is a, was a fifth or sixth great-grandfather of mine. And many Irish also settled in the Whitefield area in Lincoln County. They, they created St. Dennis Parish and Church, which was, is the second oldest Catholic church in Maine. And these Irish came from all over Ireland and settled in that area. And uh, they were buried in St. Dennis Cemetery. In Portland, the Irish, as I said, started settling here in waves in the 1720s to the 1750s. They, they fought in the French and Indian Wars. The first Catholic that we know of was Alexander Hayes, baptized here in Poland in 1798 by John Chevris, who became the Bishop of Boston. County Clare native Timothy Galvin, who was buried in a cemetery in East Daring, was a schoolmaster here and a surveyor and a merchant. And uh, he taught a lot of the children in East Daring and Stroutwater. In 1822, the first Southern Mass in Maine was celebrated by Bishop Chevris in the home of Grocers Nicholas Shea and Barbara Conley. Nicholas Shea was from County Waterford. The Irish started pouring into Maine, including Poland, in the 1820s to the 1850s, and they were from all over Ireland, but especially from counties Derry, Leitrim, Donegal, Cork, and Meath. The great influx of Galway immigrants began during Angorta Moore, the Great Hunger of the late 1840s, it continued unabated until the 1920s, with a huge increase in the 1880s due to the 1880 famine. Galwegians also started coming again in the late 1940s and early 1950s, many of them Irish speakers from Connemara. Canadian Irish have settled in Maine since the early 1800s. They came from St. John and St. Andrews, New Brunswick, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Montreal, Newfoundland, and they continued to come to Maine for work right through the 1920s. We have a lot of photographs here at the Irish Harrison of these people 
and families, and but a lot of them are unidentified, but which we will take a look at. And uh, the, a lot of these photographs, of course, are all of them are important to genealogists and historians. Today's program, of course, fe uh, features two uh, illustrious professors from the National University of Ireland in Galway, NUI Galway, Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, who's in the Department of History there, and also Professor John Breslin, who comes from the Engineering Department, also NUIG Galway. Together, in the year 2020, just uh, a year ago, through Marion Press in Dublin, they co-authored a book by the name of Old Ireland in Color. And this is what is being featured today. You'll hear, you've heard from them, and uh, it's a very exciting project, first of all, by combining two otherwise disparate uh, divisions or departments in the university. This is uh, what most universities are doing today, trying to look at the study of history, not through a single lens, but looking at it uh, in a multi-dimensional fact uh, feature. So we're very happy to have uh, both Sarah Ann Buckley and John Breslin here on this program today and I'm sure that you will enjoy their presentation as much as we did here in Portland. Again, thank you. So thanks uh, Mike for the uh, introduction and it's great for us both to be here today. We're, we're delighted to be able to talk a little bit about our recent book, Old Ireland in Colour. Um, so uh, myself, uh, John and Sarah Ann, we, we, we both work in NUI Galway, um, but unusually this book has been a real pandemic work because we've never actually met in person. And um, I think this is a, you know, today's um, video is a little bit like that in that we're meeting you all virtually, but um, hopefully we'll get to give a good overview of the book and um, show you some of the, some of our favorite images from the book as well. So before we go into the individual images, uh, just to say there's 173 photographs in the book and it really spans a really critical uh, period in Irish history. So from just before the Great Famine to just before the outbreak of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And I think it's important to say, as I'm sure many of you know, the population of the island it went from just over 8 million to a low of 4 million in the 1950s. So we think that the photographs really reflect both the public and the private lives of people. And that's how we've divided uh, the, the collection. And also just, I suppose, uh, a thank you to um, the amazing archives and archivists in Ireland. So we'll be referring to the National Library of Ireland, to na the National Folklore Collection, and then also outside of Ireland, the Library of Congress and the Getty Museum. So to draw attention to these amazing photographic collections as well. Yeah, there's some really fantastic resources out there. And, you know, we, we refer to these throughout the book, but, you know, um, actually, one of the largest collections in Ireland is the Lawrence Collection, which was taken by a photographer called Robert French. And there's some 40,000 images in the National Library of Ireland, but also some amazing photographs, as Sarah mentioned, in the National Folklore Collection, which is held in UCD, and we'll be pointing those out during, during the talk. So maybe we, we, we'll get started with the first image, if that's okay, Sarah Ann, which is uh, from Dublin. So this is a really iconic image. It's the shelled ruins of Dublin, Dublin city centre just after the rising. So really important moment in Irish history. It's from the Kyo collection, uh, the Kyo brothers. Um, so they have around 330 uh, images in the National Library from this collection. And we can see so many landmarks. So Nelson's Pillar, uh, the statue of John Gray, and we can also see just the utter devastation in the city after the events of Easter week and the Easter rising, but also people beginning to go about their lives again, which I think is, is really important to highlight. And John will talk more about the colorizations and uh, the advertisements that you can see, but we have the tram passing in this photograph, the number 244 and all the advertisements there um, and I think when we are referring to images around the so-called Irish Revolution 
some of the resources that are so important to us, uh, the Atlas of um, the Irish Revolution, also the Dictionary of Irish Biography, which is online now. And there's been amazing events in Ireland and abroad around the decade of centenaries. So uh, I think this photograph has so much resonance for that me that reason as well. Yeah, it's, it's really an amazing photograph. And um, we were able to get a rough date on when it was taken because there is a similar photograph from a collection called the West Drop uh, album, which is held in Trinity College, Dublin. And there is a building which is shown here, which is in one state of demolition in the West Drop photograph. And then it's, um, it's um, you know, you can see more of the building has been taken away in this photograph. So we reckon it's around the 17th or 18th of May. Um, from this and you know that would be uh, just a few weeks after the the easter rising so you know as sarah I mentioned you can see the the gpo in, in the background nelson's pillar and um, you know even just for me when i was um uh, looking at this there was different aspects which i was unaware of for example john gray and i think the statue is actually still there it's just been moved slightly uh on, on the street but he was actually born in claire morris in county mayo and um you know every little part of the picture there's there's details that you kind of when you um look a little bit closer you you, you start to notice beside the gpo there is a chemist called um laird's uh pharmacy or, or laird's chemist and it was actually called laird's pillar pharmacy because it's right beside nelson's pillar which of course is no longer there and um in the foreground you'll see a, a bearded man um just beside the bicycle there and there's actually a kind of a stone slab in front of him and actually written on the, the slab, I, when I zoomed in, I could see the, the writing here. It says Reis, R-E-I-S, Chambers. And it turns out it's from a, a building that was actually occupied by the revolutionaries and it was destroyed in, 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 the, um, in, in the battle. And the, uh, I think James Connolly was, was um, known for having sent a message to the rebels there in that building with, with instructions. So again, just a huge amount of detail. But I think the interesting thing is that even you know, just a week or two after the the rising that people were just going about their their, their everyday life. So um, yeah, and there's lots of uh, ads as, as Sarah Ann mentioned there. You know, for for uh, drinks like Bovril, which is a warm hot drink, which is popular or was popular in, in the UK and, and in Ireland. Uh, ads for bacon and soap and so on. And you can see the trams there. The trams were um, at this stage they were electric powered, but they had been horse drawn before that. But we used. Um, different records for the colors of the trams. They were uh, a blue and ivory color, so that would be used for the colorization of the photograph. So, um, yeah, for okay, we'll go on to the next picture, which is of Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. So, this is a really iconic image. Furthest to the right, we have Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, and it's taken as she arrives at Richmond Barracks for the court martial of Captain uh, John Bowen Colehurst, who had murdered her husband, Francis, in uh, 1916. And he was found guilty, but insane. So he spent 18 months in Broadmoor, and then he uh, went on to Canada. But we also have in this photograph, Meg Connery, we have Mary Sheehy Kettle, and Kathleen Cruz O'Brien. So these women are all suffragists, they're activists, and they have a huge influence on uh, political life in 20th century Ireland. And Hannah, she she was a feminist, a socialist, she was a Republican, and she was very consistently a radical voice in 20th century Ireland. And she's a founder member of the Irish Women's Franchise League. Um, she married Francis, she, Francis Skeffington in 1903. And they infamously took each other's surnames as a, a feminist act, which was uh, very unusual at the time. And we have actually another photograph in the book of Hannah in January 1917 outside Carnegie Hall with her then young son, Owen. Um, and after the death of Frances, she went on an 18 month tour of the US. So she gave over 200 and 50 speeches and she was really drawing attention to the situation in Ireland um, obviously using her own and herself and Owen's own personal situation um, and it's part of a section of the book on women and children and I suppose it was very important to us there, 
there has been an increasing interest in the history of women and gender history in Ireland over the last 30, 40 years. So uh, we have figures like Maud Gaughan, uh, Muriel Murphy McSweeney, Mother Jones, Grace Gifford. And we really just wanted to draw attention to these amazing women and the work that they've done and I guess the impact they've had um, on modern Irish history. So I let John talk more about the colorization now. Yeah, so it's another really striking picture. And I suppose even just uh, one small thing I mentioned about the, the choice of, of, of colors for the clothing, you know, we, we know this is obviously a very somber event for, for the family. And, um, you know, there was various discussions around, you know, what color clothes would they have been wearing? Somebody suggested a certain, you know, uh, color coat and so on for uh, Meg Connery on the, on the left. But I suppose the main thing is it, is it would have been a very, um, as I said, kind of very serious um, event in terms of the, the court, um, the court martial, and um, we chose, I suppose, colours then, you know, based on that. So they're quite, quite somber. Um, pictures from the, the the Library of Congress, which has some amazing images of uh, Irish scenes, but also uh, the Irish from uh, primarily in, in the U.S., but you know, for, from from different uh, places around the world. So um, again, it's a great resource we've made use of throughout the book. And as, as uh, Sarah mentioned, we have the, the second picture, which is also from the Library of Congress in, in our book of, of Hannah and, and Owen, who went on to become an Irish senator. And actually one of uh, Owen's children works with us in, in Enyoi Galway as a lecturer, which is a, a connection between um, uh, uh, Galway and, 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 and the family as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, you know again you can see probably in the background there's there is some soldiers which again it, it, this is from um, from uh, obviously you know a time when there would have been loads loads of soldiers present at, at the court martial and um, again it's it's uh, an interesting snapshot and I think also points to the fact that many great photographs of Ireland uh, are to be found in, in in libraries in Ireland but also around the world. So, uh, and another example of that is the next photograph, because this photograph is actually from the National Library of France, um, or Gallica Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So, uh, I'll let you say a little bit about this, Sarah, Anne, if that's okay. Yeah, this this is, thanks, John. It's a really striking photograph, I think. Um, it's a wounded British soldier who's been carried along East Essex Street just after a, a raid on a ration party. And I suppose, What's really interesting about this photograph is it's actually a kind of a scene of solidarity in the middle of what, what was a, a wartime situation. And you can see the boy on the left, he's carrying the soldier's legwear of putties. And it is very much, um, as I say, this, this moment, this one moment of solidarity. And I think it also shows um, the participation of younger people and young men in particular. And, and children in the conflict. And it's something that has been coming through the historiography more and more, um, that it was a very youthful revolution. And a lot of those that participated were under the age of 25 and many of them uh, were in Nafina Erin. And even those that weren't actually uh, participating in, in a more legitimate way they were coming into contact with this violence. So I think it's a really human photo. Um, and as John said, the National Library of France, it just shows the global reach of the events in Ireland at the time. And um, we know now um, that there were some key moments that just had huge international attention. Um, so I'm gonna let John talk a bit more about the colorization and, and how he went about that. Yeah, so uh, I suppose the main thing I, I would say is that initially when I looked at this photograph and when it was in black and white, I assumed that the uh, chap being carried was a, was an Irish soldier because you know um, he's obviously surrounded by by uh, Irish people in, in in Dublin and being carried off. It didn't at an initial glance it didn't seem to make sense that um, that it could be otherwise, but of course, um, of course, as it turned out, you know it was forbidden to actually wear. Um, uh, the the uniform of, of the the rebel army as it was at, at the time in 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 Dublin, and there wasn't really any chance that this could have been a you know a, a, an Irish uh, soldier. Um, and on a closer inspection, then you know the, the uniforms are actually quite similar: the Irish uniform at the time and the the British uniform. 
And the British uniform was from World War One. It was uh, the same uniform they would have worn in, in, in WW1. So it was basically a khaki colored uniform. And uh, one of the distinguishing things was the, the, the putties, which um, more British soldiers wore than, than Irish soldiers at the time. There was some Irish soldiers wearing them, but it was, it was mainly a, a British thing. So a couple of signals, I suppose, towards that, and then the closer inspection, it turned out, in fact, it was a, a British soldier. Um, so this is, again, uh, I suppose, uh, as, as Sarah Ann mentioned, a scene of solidarity then because of that, when you realize that it was a young uh, man. And he's obviously in, in, in quite a bit of pain, as you can see there, uh, for, from his expression. But um, again, it's a fascinating scene. I think uh, a number of people have pointed to the one of the gentlemen carrying uh, the, the soldier, the guy on the, on the right hand side. People say, is that Gabriel Byrne? He looks quite, uh, quite like him, a striking resemblance. Um, but no, it's, 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 it's a, great, um, a great image. And I spend a little while trying to pinpoint you know, the location on, on Essex Street. Sometimes it's difficult to find uh, where exactly these, these, uh, these have been taken. But, you know, with a bit of work, I don't think I found the exact location for this one, but with a bit of work, you can definitely find many of the locations for these photographs. Um, and one which would be a lot easier to find is the next photograph, because it is from a, a famous Dublin uh, station. So we'll move on to that one now. Thanks, John. So as John said, so this is uh, at the time it was Amiens Street Station. It was renamed Connolly Station in 1966. And I guess uh, the title we have on this is Auxiliaries, but I suppose it is in some ways um, not a controversial picture, but it shows uh, a variety of narratives during the revolution. So it's a photographic print, uh, two carloads of um, auxiliaries and uh, black and tans. Um, and they were members of the I Company uh, under platoon commander Vickers. And I think, you know, it's a very interesting photograph because I think there is a sense of um, the tension at the time and particularly after it had been colorized by John, I think it's just really striking. Um, and the print, it was part of the From Turmoil to Truce exhibition in the National Photographic Archive uh, in 2019. And I suppose the history of policing around this time still hasn't uh, received maybe as much attention as other aspects. Um, and, and, you know, there was some controversy around a planned conference uh, to uh, commemorate the RIC members. Um, I think the history of the auxiliaries and black and tans is, is another key part of the Irish Revolution that we're addressing more and more. So we felt it was important to have it in the book to show that diversity, um, but very striking image. Yeah, at the again I think it's one that definitely pops a little bit when it's in color you know the, the uniforms of the black and tans they were so named because they were a mixture of of uniforms from the RIC which were a kind of a dark green color and from the sort of tan khaki colors from 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 the British side as well and um, you know they were outfitted in this kind of combination so the, yeah the picture is you know, it's been labeled as black and tans or auxiliary sometimes actually the, the, the different companies would, would mix and you may have actually had a mixture of um, of the auxiliaries and the black and tans, but um, as Sarah Ann mentioned, uh, Vickers is the commander here, and I've seen other pictures of him. So he's I can't remember exactly which one, but he's one of the chaps in in, in the front car. And um, you know the, the the train station in the background is still very recognisable. You know, not not a lot has changed from from what you see in the background on on Amiens Street to Connolly Station today. And it's interesting even just to go into Google Street View and to kind of look and see where are the pillars and where are the arches and to, to line it up to what's there today. So um, I think we're going to go back a little bit further in time to a different type of transport from these nice green uh, vehicles shown here um, to this other mode of transport. So this is, and actually I think John, this is one of your favorite images and it's definitely yeah. um, with both of us uh, working in Galway, um, a very iconic one. So it's, uh, we named it You've Got Mail, but it's a, a Royal Mail car, a 979 day car or Bianconi mail car. Um, it's Air Square in 1886. And it's a pretty iconic moment for even the history of Galway City. Um, so what we can see is it's, it's near Webb's Hotel, which is now the Imperial Hotel. 
and we also have Black's Royal Hotel. Um, so these really important uh, features of tourism at the time. Um, and Black's was actually a noted Galway landmark. And in one of its adverts, it said that uh, in the 70 years since its establishment, it has been, quote, patronized by nobility and gentry and offered guests free omnibuses to and from trains and steamers. So it was the height of, um, I suppose, modernization at the time. And uh, just worth saying that, I guess, when we're looking at photographs like this, we're also considering the history and the context of, of where it was taken. So uh, Galway, even though it had gotten a tourist boost in, in the mid 19th century with the train from Galway City, um, the railway from Dublin, uh, the population had actually fallen from about 24,000 to 1851 to 13,000 to 1891. So when we're looking at these photographs in that context as well, I think it's really important. Um, and John will, will talk more about the colorization, but uh, we do believe that the the gentleman on the right uh the hipster gentleman is robert french uh who took as john said earlier on many of the the photographs um that we've looked at and part of that huge collection in in the national library yeah it's um it, it, it's very uh very interesting photograph you know for, for various reasons you know as sarah mentioned obviously the buildings in the background like the hotel and so on Black's Royal Hotel now is the site of uh, Supermax, which is our Irish version of, of McDonald's and well known by many Irish people. Um, and actually that, that little coat of arms, which is just above the word Black's in the photograph, it's still there today. You can see it um, over, over the over the restaurant. Um, you know, the population thing is interesting as well because the population of Connacht has not grown largely over what it was a hundred years ago. Um, so despite the fact that, you know, as Sarah Ann mentioned, Galway fell in population kind of over that 50 year period from the 1850s to the 1900s, um, and now it's risen back to probably, you know, 60, 70,000, the overall population of Connacht is still much the same, which means that the population has grown in the city and it's dropped in, 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 in the more rural areas, which you would kind of expect, but overall, you know, even from from, from 100 years ago, it's uh, it, it's striking that the, the population has kind of stayed level in in, in the region. Um, the, the, you know, I, I just love the the picture in terms of all all the people and the faces and and so on. So you can see the gentleman looking over his kind of arm, and there's actually a little uh, head behind him there. This is the, the guy on the very right of the carriage with the bowler hat, and there's an ear kind of peeping out there. But I often say that, you know, if there was ever a book uh, by Agatha Christie in terms of murder on the Galway mail car, you've got a likely cast of characters here. They all really, you know, they, it's almost like a, a scene from a, a movie or, 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 or an acting shoot, you know, um, perfectly posed. And of course, you know, camera exposures took a long time in these days. You can see one of the horse's legs uh, moving a little bit. And as Sarah Ann mentioned, um, Robert French, who really was just a perfectionist in terms of photographs he took 30,000 glass plates of the 40,000 estimated to be by him in, in, in the National Library of Ireland and uh, yeah, I just think it's amazing looking at this and, and imagining um, how different it is from today I actually, just to, to play around a little bit, I took the background from today and superimposed it on, on, on the picture here to kind of imagine if this little uh, carriage was actually sitting in, 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 in Air Square today um, where all the buses and cars would be now but you know, it's just a, it really is a, a fascinating picture. So I think we have another picture from Robert French coming up, which is um, from, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, around the same time. Actually, it's from a, a year or two later. Um, and the reason we know this is because of what's going on. So this is um, a scene of an eviction, which uh, unfortunately was a, a common occurrence for for many, many families at the end of the, the 19th century. And this was taken, as John said, by Robert French. Um, and I suppose it's it's quite an iconic one because, and it was recorded uh, in a lot of the, the newspapers, um, because pictured we have farmer and boat builder Francis Tully, who is also known as uh, Dr. Tully, who was a really prominent activist 
for the plan of campaign in Galway. So very much uh, arguing for a, an attempt to gain lower rents through collective bargaining um, and very much, I suppose, trying to advocate for families who were unable to to pay the rent at those times. So this particular eviction, it's on the land of the uh, Marquis of Clonricard and it's, uh, I think it's probably a very emotive photograph. Um, there are questions around whether it was used for propaganda purposes. It, the eviction itself was, as I said, recorded in a number of the papers. And it's really, I suppose, the scene itself, uh, the, when the police and the soldiers arrived, there was a garrison of about 14 people inside the house. You know, they were blocked up. They obviously were refusing to come out. Um, and the the violence and the ways in which the authorities uh, used hot pokers, pikes um, and other kind of weapons to uh, remove those in there. It was it was very aggressive. Um, and at the time, it, it stirred a lot of emotions, you know, locally and internationally. Um, but I think even to this day, it's it's a photograph that uh, people find, um, I suppose, quite quite upsetting, and have it has quite an impact. Um, and John, do you want to say a bit more about this? Sure. Yeah. So um, you know, it's I suppose we kind of wonder was Robert French just in the right place at the right time? But there are a number of pictures like this in the National Library of Ireland's uh, Lawrence Collection. So I'm sure uh, you know it was probably either you know known because there's obviously a crowd of people who were, were gathered here for it. But he probably also just kind of came across these events um, happening. So uh, you know, this chap, uh, Dr. Tully, he, he was um, obviously on on the property of this uh, Mar Marquis of Clan Rickards, and the Clan Rickards were, you know, not very popular in in, in Galway for, for for many years. I think one of their one of the family had had a statue in Air Square that was pulled down and thrown into the canal, as far as I remember. So um, this was obviously a, a, another event that wouldn't have added to their popularity. Um, Tully, you know, he was called Dr. Tully because he prescribed um, leaden pills or bullets for the the, uh, the greedy landlords, and he wasn't a doctor at all. He was actually a bullet builder, so he had a pretty good living. And he has, you know, I suppose slate roofed houses wouldn't have been that common at the time, but you can see here there's slates on the roofs as uh, on the roof as opposed to to straw. Um, and he and about fourteen people were inside a house, you know, as the Soldiers were trying to, to break in there, as you can see, with their ladder is trying to break into the roof. The, uh, the, 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 the group of people, the 14 or 15 people inside, were inside with their um, pokers and they were sticking out to try and get the, the, the people off the ladders as well. So there was people poking in, people poking out. And um, anyway, of course, eventually um, they, you know, I, I think what happened was um, somebody inside just. Um, you know, maybe gosh, too excited, and um, uh, you know, broke through, and then that um, when when they started to break in, they they basically they tried to break out to defend the house, and then that led to the house being taken. So, um, as um, as Sarah Ann mentioned, you know, it, it's it, it's a striking image. This one used by 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 Maud Gone to agitate for change. It was projected onto a building in Parnell Square in Dublin, and um, it's it's. Uh, I suppose also even just in, in in the scene there, you know, you've got different types of soldiers. We have the Scottish Rifles or the Cameronians, as they were called. They were named after a guy called Cameron, um, visible in, in in the picture. So, again, a lot a lot going on here. There's a tree trunk as well, um, somewhere which was being used. Uh, yeah, you can see it on the left hand side there being that was probably being used as a battering ram. So, quite a lot going on in this picture. Um, so we have another uh, a picture which is um. Again, from a, a time of strife, but um, a, a large story in, in the background here. So maybe Sarah Ann, you can just say a little bit about the story behind this picture. Thanks, John. This is, as you say, it's it's a kind of a very uh, key upsetting moment in in Irish history. But this photograph is actually one of of survival. Um, so it's from the Pool Collection, and it's the Riley family who were from Bradford uh, in England. And they actually, you know, they survived the sinking of the Lusitania um, off Kinsale Head in, in County Cork. So this was actually taken in Cove, um, where I actually was born and raised. And 
uh, it was known as as Queenstown. Obviously, many people will will know it as, and it was itself a key part of uh, the history of emigration from Ireland. Um, so we this was taken on the eighth of May in nineteen fifteen, and it's Annie and Edward Riley and their four year old twins Ethel and Sutcliffe, and the National Library of Ireland. The entry states that they had actually been living in in the US and Massachusetts and they were traveling to visit relatives in England during World War I. Um, and they were one of the very few uh, Lusitania families who who survived and they later went on and, and uh, traveled home to Bradford. Um, so of the 2000 uh, people that were, were on board the Lusitania, um, 764 were saved so uh, and we actually in the book we have another photograph of the old cemetery in Cove and of the mass burials there and it's still a huge part of the the history of the town and, and the locality um, so John will, will talk more about the colorization, but I suppose it just ties in all these themes of emigration family um and it also i think is is a fairly hopeful photograph so uh it's definitely been a popular one in the book so john i leave you talk a bit more about the the funky yeah. clothes <laughs> yeah um yeah it, it was you know as sarah mentioned it was a, it was a very traumatic time you know I, one another photograph i colorized around the same time was of a, a person who worked for the kunar line in in, in cove and he was, you know, in charge of all the goods coming in. And of course, he was expecting this boat full of, of goods and passengers to come in. And instead, unfortunately, there was, um, you know, m many uh, bodies uh, com coming in from 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 the uh, from from when the 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 boat was sunk by a by a German U boat. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, I suppose, the scene, the colors, and so on. Well, the building in the background is is a pub um, called the Rob Roy Hotel. Um, on the sign just out of view on the top right it says wine and spirits vault but there's some other pictures from around the same time where you can read the the, the full title so i was looking at those to see where was it and what was it um you know for for, for some of these photographs uh you know we we try and make a a guess on on eye colors uh if, if we don't know them so you know, based on statistics of of, uh, of people in the uk we looked at kind of most common eye colors and chose blue for some of the the, the, the eye colors of, of, of the family based on that. However, you know, there are many instances of the photographs where we've actually found the actual eye colors because we have records of people traveling through, for example, through Ellis Island, where we can see the travel records and we can see hair color and, and eye color and so on. Um, and again, you know, it's, it's a photograph with, with a lot of detail. Obviously, you have the woman with the pram and the little baby in it in the background. But actually, just between that woman and the Riley family, you can just about make out a dog, which again, I didn't spot the first time around. And certainly in the black and white one, you, you'd be probably hard pushed to make it out. But in, again, in the very middle of the photograph behind Sutcliffe, uh, the little boy, there's a, a little dog there in a the picture. And I think even just the expressions on, on the faces of the, the people there, you know, looking at the, the photographer and, and everything going on. Um, it's just, uh, again, a, a fascinating picture and one that has, uh, thankfully, um, a, a bit of good news in, in this picture photograph. Um, so we have another family photograph on the uh, on the next um, image. So Sarah Ann, I'll uh, let you give some context here to this. Uh, again, it's, it's a, a, a picture with, with, with a troubled story, but um, okay. Mm. Thanks, John. So this photograph, and, and we titled it Poverty in the Irish Free State, um, it's it's taken also from the the pool collection or the pool studio and it's for me i'm a historian of of childhood and and gender and the family um but the photograph is actually a family parents grandmother and children outside their home and i suppose in many ways it just shows the the absolute poverty that um many people were living in in this is urban ireland this is in waterford uh, city at the time but we have similar images from uh, rural Ireland um, and the photograph it was paid for by a, a Mrs E White um, and this is something that we see from the, the end of the 19th century 
concerned uh, uh, local persons or philanthropists who are raising attention to uh, some of the conditions of, of poverty and a lot of the focus has been and was on at the time uh, the Dublin slums and, and the poor housing there but Waterford was also you know the focus of a lot of complaints so the Irish press the newspaper described it um, in 1936 as being as bad as the capital and it stated that there were 1300 families in need of rehousing so this kind of literally living on on the street in in what you couldn't even describe as as a tent um and i i think that you know looking at the the faces and the the clothing and the just the general condition of the children as as well as the parents and grandmother um it shows that even you know after independence there was as much poverty and as there had been before so the the focus on the social and social conditions needed to be kept up um right into into the 20th century and unfortunately housing is still a big question in ireland today but um I, i'm going to leave john talk a bit more about uh, i suppose how he colorized this really really i suppose sad image i think in lots of ways yeah um you know the I, I suppose uh, for, well first of all the, the the picture is by the the pool studio in in who had a famous studio in Waterford in Ireland and it was um established by a guy called Arthur Henry Poole who was the 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 father of the family and he took some really f fantastic photographs uh, around the region but also further afield and you'll see a number of them in our book but you know in terms of the clothes that the, the people are wearing here there it, it does seem like there's a little bit of a contrast between this home and the you know what it looked like um, more upmarket clothes, but just remember, I suppose, at the time that in the 19th century and the early 20th century, um, secondhand clothes were uh, very common. Um, sometimes people didn't didn't like to wear them for various reasons. But uh, myself and Sarah and have been referencing a great book called Dress in Ireland, which describes clothes in Ireland through the ages. And I learned a little bit, I suppose, about clothes um, at, at this time. Um, it, secondhand clothes became so common that at one point, even you know, town councils were recommending that their staff uh, have or, or, or buy secondhand clothes. It was so acceptable um, by by a certain period. So my feeling is that these definitely look like um, some some secondhand clothes that perhaps came from somewhere else in Ireland or potentially from 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 uh, from Britain. Um, you know, the the color is of, of the time for clothes. There there was a lot of browns and reds and blues and this was mainly uh, in, in Ireland due to the different dyes that were available at the time made from from natural products um, green wasn't worn a, a lot of, by by children especially in the, in, in the countryside but this is a, an urban scene um, and that was mainly to do with um, with uh, superstitions around the fairies and so on but uh, you know when clothes come from from Britain or from from wherever else I guess you take what, whatever you have. So again, it, it's just a, a guess around many of the, the clothes colors, but we've tried to stay to a kind of, a, I suppose, a certain palette of, of clothes colors that were used at the time. And, you know, I suppose the other thing is there's some striking resemblances here between the, the mother and the baby and the, the daughters in particular as well, in terms of, of, of their, their faces, you know. The grandmother actually has, a, it, 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 when you zoom in closer into the picture, you, you, you see one of her eyes is kind of white, whitish looking, and it seems that she may have been blind or had cataracts in, in, in one eye. So uh, again, it's, uh, you know, it, it's from 1924, so it's less than 100 years ago. And um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to believe that uh, people could have been, a whole family could have been living in those conditions, um, uh, such poor conditions in this, what can only be described as, you know, a, a tent of sorts. And um, this is on Alexander Street in, in Waterford. Um, so we have a happier scene uh, on, on the next slide, which is um, from not too far away, also um, uh, in, in, in the south of the country. So um, maybe Sarah Ann, you can say something about this one. Yeah, this is definitely um, definitely a happier scene. And I, as a Cork woman, obviously very happy to have another another Cork addition to uh, 
to the talk. So this is uh, and was taken during the Cork International Exhibition. Um, so this was held, uh, if you know Cork City, um, in the Mardike. And this is an image of a water shoot. Uh, I think it's a really cool, cool image. Uh, we, we named it Sliding on the Lee, um, the River Lee. And the the water shoot was it was seventy feet in height, and uh, the cars carried the passengers up um, to the summit uh, where a seat was taken in one of the boats, and they started down uh, the incline, and they just hit the water at speed, which is what we can see here. Um, and I think historically, one of the reasons, obviously, this is an excellent image, but as well possibly not as much as known about uh, the exhibition in, in 1902. And it really was this um, advertisement for all things Irish and, and all things Cork. And from the beginning of the 20th century and even a bit earlier, uh, there was a, a big marketing campaign um, for, for produce and for tourism. And I think this really highlights it. And by the close of, of the exhibition, over a million people had visited. So that's a huge, those metrics are huge, obviously. And it was seen as, you know, a real success. Um, and this photograph, because of the the trees, that they're in full leaf, we think this is from the summer months. Um, and because it was such a success, they actually ran it again the following year. So uh, it's it's just a really, I think, cool story about Cork history but also the history of um, you know Irish produce and and tourism and uh, yeah I think I'd love if they built one of these again so <laughs> yeah Pity didn't leave it there I think they, uh, you know they, they left it for another year so we've been grateful they left it for another hundred and uh, twenty years <laughs> I think a lot of people <laughs> actually saw this and they said why don't we have one of these now you know our you know why yeah. did they ever get rid of it because you know, it looked like a lot of fun. There's actually a couple of videos um, taken around the same time, um, and there's a video of, of some some um, some of the boats coming on the Great Water Shoot. But you know, again, it's fascinating because I think, as you said, Zeran, a lot of people never realised there was such a huge exhibition on in Cork at the time, and uh, it really was a kind of eye opener that you know people 120 years ago were. Well, I suppose first of all they had this mechanical system to bring up the cars up the top, the, the boats up to the top, and so on, but. Um, that there was actually so much fun being had, um, you know, in, in, in 1902. Um, the, you know, obviously this, this, this great water shoot isn't there anymore. There's actually a bridge um, which is near where this uh, shoot is called the Shaky Bridge or Davies Bridge. Um, so a lot of people from Cork who look at this will recognize exactly on where, where on the river it is. So, um, yeah, no, even for me, it was an eye opener. I, I hadn't heard of the Cork exhibition and um, you know, when you see the people watching the activities on the boat, on, on the river, the boats uh, sailing by, and all of the parades and stuff that was going on at the time, this is a great snapshot of, of the excitement of of, uh, of of the summer in 1902. Um, so we have another person having some fun on the next picture, which is also, these two pictures are from the National Library of Ireland, but from different eras. So this is, um the the latest photograph we have in the book so it's from 1969 and you know it's just such a fun image it's merchant's arch and temple bar and you can see here the the focus is very much um the little boy who's running uh with, with his present and for me um we actually found out john found out who the boy was he got in touch after he saw the image online and his name is Colin Irwin, but it really shows the uh, importance of the Old Ireland and Colour project and, and John's work in, in that community because being able to uh, find Colin, um, he told John that he has blue eyes, that he was most probably wearing a mustard coloured top and, uh, you know, even the colour of his sandals and the fact that the present that he's running with is it was a toy gun. So kind of like other images, uh, the, the cover of the book in particular, the, the image on the cover of the book, um, you know, the stories and the connections between John and those that are, are, are following the project, I think is, is fantastic. And it's a fantastic piece of uh, public history and, you know, everyone's involved in this really. Um, so also I think with this image, it's, 
if you grew up in 1960s Dublin, it probably has a lot of features that uh, I guess um, resonate. So uh, I, re I really love that it's in the book. I think it's it's a really fun uh, image to have. Yeah, it's a great image by uh, a woman called Eleanor Wiltshire. And again, we have some brilliant images by Eleanor. She she took some amazing photographs around Dublin uh, herself and her husband had, had a studio, photographic studio in, in, in Dublin. But she just seemed to capture some amazing expressions and scenes. And this one, you know, in, in near Temple Bar in, in, in Dublin at the Merchant's Arch, where if you walk through, you, you'll be familiar with kind of various shops and so on that are still there today. Um, and, and you know it's fun to get in touch with with Colin. The, the picture had been shared on the National Library of Ireland's Flickr, which is a photo sharing website page uh, a few years ago. And I'm not sure what happened. He he just happened to be browsing stuff and he found a picture of himself looking back at himself from the screen. So I knew he was out there. And then when I colorized the picture, I, I reached out to Colin, and um, eventually he came back to me and he also re responded to me on Twitter. And we had the conversation, Sarah, and mentioned about the mustard top and the beige pants and so on. So um, it was just fun to kind of get some more context there and to be able to add the correct color eyes and so on to, to, to the photograph. So um, yeah, the, the Eleanor Wilshire pictures are just um, just amazing. And I think this guy in, in, in full flight, um, the busiest boy in Dublin, it's, it, it, it's a great photograph. Um, so we have a, a, a nice picture coming up, which is from uh, Galway, which is where we are mostly based, um, which is from the National Folklore Collection which is basically a, a collection of photographs taken by the Irish Folklore Commission and it's housed in UCD. So maybe I'll just let's just say a little bit about this, Sarah. Sure, I I suppose first I'll talk a bit about the collection. Um, as John said, it's, you know, it was a huge uh, undertaking, uh, the the collection of, of folklore from in the 1930s. So it had a number of elements to it. Um, and, you know, I'd really recommend if people haven't uh, gone on to dukas.ie or or looked at or listened to some of the the testimonies I'd really recommend it um, but this is actually uh, Kathleen Price um, is a photographer another female photographer um, and what we see is that uh, you have here a married couple and um, is the title that uh, on the photograph but they're in their best of clothes um, they're obviously posing for this photograph um, as part of you know their what they've given um i'm going to let john talk about the clothing and and the colors and the significance there but we can see the house behind them it's it's fairly typical the the low door frame um you know the types of houses that we would uh i suppose imagine in rural ireland at the time um i'm also going to let john talk about uh how uh, the great grandson of the couple were in touch and, and the details there. But for me, this photograph is very much rural Ireland in the 1930s. It's very dignified. Um, and as I say, the, the project in, in the new state of ensuring that the stories, that the photographs, that um, even the, the stories of childhood were preserved has you know been extremely useful to historians and if you then match that with uh the census where where we actually were able to to track this couple uh Marcin and and peg um we can see that there's you know many ways for for families to to kind of be a genealogy or otherwise to look at their their relatives and their history um so i'm going to leave john talk a bit more about the clothing and uh about uh the connection uh with this couple's great grandson. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And so, uh, you know, as, as Sarah mentioned, the National Folklore Collection, an, an amazing resource. Just, you know, go to ducas.ie, which is D U C H A S.ie, um, because they have not only photographs like this one there from all around the country, in fact, all around the island, but they also have um, two collections. One is called the Schools Collection which were basically stories that were gathered by school children in, fr from their families, from their grandparents um, all around the country. I actually found a story there by my great aunt um, in County Clare, where she had written um, various stories from, from, from around the locality. So they would be a combination of folklore and you know local stories, maybe stories about places and so on, and um, information they would gather from their families. And then there's also the manuscripts collection, which is the main folklore collection 
where a lot of these photographs would have been taken when they were traveling around the country. They would have been gathering stories, but they also would have taken uh, or had a photographic record and also an audio record in some cases at the same time. They used a, an Eddy phone to record um, audio at the time as well. Um, and then Sarah mentioned as well the you know the, the the census information. We actually were able to confirm the date with the great grandson of the couple in the photograph. The couple are um, Marcino Conora and Peggy Lee Nifaharta, which uh, who who were married in Cairo. So you'll have heard Mike Connolly talking about the connections between between Galway and and Maine, in particular Kashfarga, which is a, a seaside um, area. Um, extending from just outside Galway City out um, out through a number of, of coastal towns. And a little bit further out is Cairo, which um, or Cavarur, which means the Red Quarter. And this, this couple would have lived um, lived there. Um, so their, their great grandson actually contacted me, Michal O'Connor, and we were uh, talking on Twitter um, and we basically uh, verified the date and then we would calculate their ages from the census because in the census they are listed as being a certain age and then this picture was taken in 1936 and we were able to calculate that our ages would have been 67 for Marcin on the right and 64 for Peggy on, on the left. Um, so again initially in, in terms of the, the, the clothes colours there aren't a lot of colour photographs from from, uh, from from Ireland in, in the first half of the 20th century. There are a small amounts. There was a a, uh, a wealthy uh, uh, business person called Albert Kahn actually sent two French women around Ireland to take photographs. And there's some fantastic colour photographs actually taken in Galway about 20 years earlier, which are amongst the, the fewest colour photographs of, of the time using a process called autochromes. And they would have captured various people wearing the Galway shawls in, in varying colours of red and brown. So we would have used those for, 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 for the colours here. Um, but they, they, these are also documented in, in the records as well. So in the National Folklore Collection, you will find a lot of um, uh, records of the colors used, as I mentioned earlier on, in terms of dyes and so on. So we can, again, use a combination of of uh, you know pictures that people drew of colors at, uh, of clothes at the time, of uh, written records of, of the clothes people wore, and also the, the few color pictures that actually exist to help us with with, with colors for this. And um, the gentleman, I gave him brown tweed, which again, based on discussions, seemed to be um, uh, basically, I, I suppose, a good fit for what he would have been wearing at the time. And, um, you know, just interesting to see the very low door in the background. I can imagine how many times they must have bumped their heads going in and out of this cottage. So um, we have quite a different looking picture coming up next, um, <laughs> going from rural Galway to, we're back to Waterford again. Yeah, so this is again from um, the pool collection. It's from 1885. And it is members of Waterford Boat Club, which uh, is the oldest sports club in, in Waterford City. And um, I know that when when this photograph was uh, uh, on the Late Late Show, that there is lots of comments on Twitter about it. Some of them I, I can't even talk about here. Um, so the the outfits of of these gentlemen. So we have Austin Farrell is is in the center, and he's holding a rudder. And uh, it is a, a fairly hipster looking photograph. Um, and the, I guess the history of sport in Ireland has been getting more and more attention um, and rowing now becoming part of that uh, by historians. So um, the Irish Amateur Rowing Union, it was first established in 1899 in Dublin. Um, and the whole aim was just to to put the sport on a proper footing, which I think it, it certainly is in Ireland uh, over the last ten years in particular. Um, uh, John he John used the the club colours, so blue and white for the outfits, um, and I think it's you know it's quite a modern looking photograph in many ways, um, and it's certainly attracted a lot of attention uh, when it's been out there you know, the silverware and, and other aspects. Uh, so definitely one that um, people are very interested in. And uh, just from that excellent pool collection again in the National Library of Ireland. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, it's an amazing photograph considering it's, you know, 136 years old. Um, and when I was looking at it, I didn't really know what he was holding in, in his hands, the, the chap in the middle who's who's the uh, 
the Coxway and Austin Farrell. But I thought it was a boot or something. It looked like one one of those kind of um, ski shoes or something. I wasn't really sure exactly what it was. But it turns out, anyway, it's the rudder um, from, from from their boat. And uh, again, a great collection of, of, of silverware. And as Sarah mentioned, you know, we use blue and white colors, which are still used by the club today um, for their outfits. But, you know, I love their massages and their, you know, their, their nicely waxed hair and, and, and so on. They're, they're, it's, it's a great pose. Um, so yeah, um, we, maybe we'll have a look at our, our next picture, which again, it's um, it's from Galway again. We have another yeah, another Galway image. Um, this one is uh, it's from the Eason collection in the National Library of Ireland. Um, we titled it the Clad a Catch, so it's it's uh, taken, you know, near the Clada, and all the women in it are from the Clada area in Galway City, which is. Uh, obviously very historic area today it's a really popular um, tourist area and uh, I'll let John talk more as I say about um, what the women are wearing but um, we have Noni or Nanny O'Donnell Mary Rogers Kitty Conley and Mrs Gill and uh, they are basically have the clad a catch so we have what appears to be a, a fairly decent sized turbot um, and there may also be uh, the woman on the left uh, may have some seaweed covering some fish in the basket um, and I think that you know it's 1905 that this is taken and at that time um, the fishing industry in Clada was in decline so there was the onset of modern trawlers and uh, you know it's for that reason it's it's quite an iconic image in regards to the the history of industry in Galway um and we had uh my colleague John Cunningham in the history department who's a, a historian of of Galway city and county um was very helpful with with some of these images but I I think the time it's taken um it's just a really key moment uh we also use the census for this so um to, to look at the ages of, of the women at the time. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll leave John talk a bit about that now, but I suppose uh, some of the women are perhaps younger than you'd expect, which I think is quite important too. Um, it, it shows, I suppose, uh, how difficult in many ways life was at the time. Um, so I'll pass that over to you, John. Yeah. Um exactly so when i was looking for the names in in the census records to try and kind of extrapolate what ages they would have been you know as sarah Ann mentioned um it seemed for example the woman who possibly you know there i suppose it's difficult sometimes to match up names when you don't have a lot of information about exactly where the person came from but um kitty Keneally or catherine connelly Keneally and connelly sometimes used interchangeably um in in, in galway um, there were two in the records, and the one that seemed to be the closest match was in their 60s. And again, uh, sometimes you know the census records were the, the the ages can be um, inexact, and sometimes you have to consult more than one year to see how how much variation there are in the ages. But um, we did find uh, Nanny uh, Connolly or Nanny O'Donnell in Dogfish Lane, which was an area where many of the fishing people lived in the census records. So. Um, it's a lovely photograph taken just beside the Spanish arch and in this area the, the fishing or, or the fish market was traditionally held and there's quite a large number of pictures from the Lawrence collection from the various stereograph cards in the Library of Congress of fish markets in, in this area and again we would have chosen um, the same combinations of reds and browns for, for, for the shawls and, and petticoats which again were were recorded and also in the collections, the color collections uh, of the time. And, and in the far background, you can see some of the cottages in, in, in the Clada. So the Clada is on the far side of, of the river there, that's the river Corrib. And um, a lot of those cottages were very picturesque, but also uh, not very uh, good conditions to live in. And they were demolished around the 30s and 40s and um, largely replaced by more modern county council or city council um, housing after that. But um, you know, it's 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 a it's a great um, picture, and you know the size of the fish, and then you can see some smaller fish peeking out, as Sarah mentioned in, in, in the basket being held there. Um, and again, if you're if you've ever come to Galway or been in Galway, you'll recognise this spot once you um, once you pl place it beside the Spanish Arch. So um, yeah, we have some some uh, other uh, young women in the next picture, which is taken by um, or taken from the National Folklore Collection as well. 
Yeah, this is also from um, 1924 uh, when we are, we discussed uh, the poverty in the Irish Free State photograph before. Um, but this is two girls uh, from the Blasket Islands. Um, and I think that, you know, many of the photographs from the particularly the islands um, have, you know, been very popular um, often because we see, I suppose, a, a, a lifestyle that... Uh, really kind of depicts a I suppose more traditional Irish feel so the the Blasket Islands even at at their height had you know 175 residents so um, it's a small population Irish speaking until 1953 um, this photograph I love like obviously that you know we've titled it smiling and curious but the the, the girls are obviously very happy um, it was taken by uh, one of the world's leading uh, ethnographers or uh, folklore scholars um, who travelled to Ireland uh, Carol W. Von Sido who his trip to Ireland actually I suppose in many ways shows how important Ireland was uh, globally um, when it came to the folklore project and uh, you know I he was writing uh, in journals particularly comparative folklore journals um using the Irish case and looking at the islands. Um, so this is again from the National Folklore Collection. Um, and as a historian of childhood, I just think it's it's just, it's a great image. It's obviously, John can talk more about the, the clothing. It's not that there's not, uh, it's not affluent. Um, the girls are obviously both barefoot, which wouldn't have been that unusual actually. Um, uh, but they're obviously extremely happy as well, and they're extremely happy to be photographed, which I think is is the important thing. Um, and I guess the islands at the time, um, economically, uh, boat fishing, a, a certain amount of, of farming would have been how uh, residents were making their living. So it is that kind of context as well that we're that we're looking at when we're looking at these images. But John, I'll pass this over yeah. to you. Thanks, Aaron. So yeah, the clothes, you know, you can see obviously uh, quite worn. There's a number of holes and a number of patches, but you know, the girls are, are happy nonetheless. Kids are kids, as as I've mentioned a number of times. And actually, I was just talking to Jean uh, from, from from the Main Heritage Centre just before this, and we were just remarking how the girl in the background in the black and white version, you almost don't notice her. And it's when, you know, when the picture is in colour, um, her face kind of pops out in, in more detail. So you can see the difference going from one to the other. Um, I, I suspect as well, you know, if you went back to the baskets, you know, many of the stone structures, at least part of them are still standing. You, you could probably try and match up these um, these walls here to figure out uh, where it was taken. They're a bit like fingerprints, I think, stone walls. They all have their own little personality and character. And um, as Sarah Ann mentioned, you know, Carl von Zito, uh, the ethnographer, he also was the father of the actor Max von Zito, who'd be well known from various films, including uh, The Great Story Ever Told, and he was Ming the Merciless in Flash Gordon and died last year. So um, a, a connection there from, uh, from from the Swedish ethnographer to the Irish folklore collection. And there, indeed, there was many famous uh, folklorists and collectors of, um, of of information around the Irish language and, and culture who came to to this region of, of, um, of Ireland. Um, we have some great pictures in the book of Peg Sayers, who is a famous, famous Irish writer and another famous um, um, language scholar, Kenneth Jackson, is, is pictured in, in the book with her as well. So I think we're going to stay in Kerry for our last picture, which is coming up. So this, yeah, our final picture. Um, I suppose as we, we've taken a number of images from uh, the first section of the book, which is on on the Irish Revolution. And, you know, part of it is that um, there's a huge interest in in obviously the revolutionary period, but also there's a lot of amazing images from the time. So I previously had mentioned the Kyo collection. Um, this is British soldiers who are searching trains uh, on the Kerry line for Republicans. Um, so this is obviously... Uh, Kerry during uh, particularly the War of Independence was a was a a, a hotbed of uh, of events. So I think that like this image for many people has um, a lot of symbolism to it. Um, John is going to talk about uh, the the advice we got in regards to the stripes on the uniforms and also the 
the railway coaches, but uh, we can see that the the helmets are the, the greenish color of uh, and the of the First World War, um, and the same for the khaki uniforms. And uh, I think that you know we this photograph has gotten a lot of attention, I suppose, um, just for what it evokes around around that time period. So it's probably a, a, a good one to end. Um, when we're talking about the revolution and and all the different issues that were going on at the time, but I'm, I'm going to leave John talk a bit more about uh, the the research and the advice he got in particular on the uniforms. Yeah, so it's it's, it's a good example, I think, of of, uh, of images evolving, and you know, it was pretty obvious in terms of uniforms. There, as Sarah Ann mentions, that we would have had the khaki uniforms of the British soldiers, which again would have been um, a holdover from from World War One. And you know, I would have looked at various types of, of helmets to try and there, there is a varied range of, of kind of brownie and green colors. But this is one particular one that I thought suited quite well, and um, it, it it was typical again of, of the the helmet colors being used at the time. But as um, as Sarah mentioned, we also got some more information afterwards about the colors of the train. So I think the original color I just you know picked on was kind of a greenish color. And someone advises that because these trains would have been on the Great Southern and Western Railway, a guy called Donica Cronin, that they would have been a clarish red color. So it would have gone and updated the, the, the colors. It's quite subtle, but you can see there the kind of the reddish hue on, on, on the, the carriage to the front. And then the second thing, which um, I would have updated, which is on the soldier, which is in the very, who is in the middle of the photograph, is that on, on the arm of his uniform, there's a number of, um, of, of, chevrons you know the, the the stripes on on army uniforms and again i think i'd chosen originally some golden color based on some other chevrons I, I'd, I'd seen but um a guy called noel mcgillian advises that these were actually good conduct or overseas service stripes that would have been given for for service overseas and that they would have been blue and blue and red so again we went back and updated the photograph um based on that so again like all of these photographs there's, there's sometimes there's a lot of small details that as you start to look in a bit more, more, uh, more or as you start to look a bit more closely, I should say, these details pop out, and um, I think they in turn help the photographs pop out as well a bit more in color. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed um, some of the the photographs we've shown you. I think a range of photographs from peaceful times, from uh, trouble times, from uh, the cities, from the country. And um, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. And you know, uh, I'll just hand over to Sarah and just say a few words uh, before we go to our Q and A. But um, thanks again. I hope you found those interesting. Yeah, th thanks so much for for the invite and uh, to Jean and to everyone else. Um, and I guess what we hope the book reflects is just how diverse uh, Irish society was um, in the nineteen twentieth century. Um, Obviously, as well, one of the sections is the Irish abroad. So it reflects, I suppose, the influence that um, those who left Ireland have had uh, internationally. So, um, yeah, we're just looking forward to the questions. Thanks very much for having us. So um, yeah, um, if if, uh, if if that's okay, I, I think um, we can we can hand, we can move over to the Q and A session with um, Matt Barker and Mike Connolly, and so looking forward to hearing your questions. Sorry, Jean, I missed that there. I'm not. I'm not sure. The, the... What, what are the origins of the photos, Sarah? -Ann? I think somebody was asking where where did the photos come from. 
So we have a really um, wide range. So a lot of them are public collections, the National Library of Ireland, the National Folklore Collection, uh, the Getty Museum. And then um, we do have, there's also one or two private also, but um, mostly we're trying to highlight the cultural institutions in Ireland and the amazing photographic collections that, that we have. Yeah, there is, um, th there is, I suppose, photographs from local libraries, from national libraries, from, you know, uh, libraries all around the world, as, as, as I mentioned during the talk. Um, well, I suppose what I can say maybe is just in terms of where did we kind of get started as well. Um, I just started colorizing some pictures from around Galway. And as you know, there's great links between Galway and, and, and Portland. And actually just behind me here, uh, to either side, uh, I'm actually backing onto Galway Bay. I'm in the very north of Clare at the moment. Um, so I've moved locations from, from the video, but the, um, the, to my left, to your right, I guess, is um, mainland Galway over here across the bay. So the area that Mike was talking about, um, Koshfariga, which goes from Galway City out towards Inverne, is basically that area over there. And then over in this direction, we have the Iron Islands, which again, we have many photographs from, uh, from, from the Iron Islands in the book. So, you know, I start colorizing pictures from around Galway, but then of course there's lots of other sources, you know, like the National Library of Ireland, the National Folklore Collection, as you mentioned. And then, um, as I said, there's, there's lots of um, great photographs in, in, in collections around the world. So that, that was the main, I suppose, origin of, of the photographs, those, those local, national, and then even international collections. Okay, thank you uh, for that, John. So the next question was, how do you choose the color palette for colorizing the photos? Yeah, so I guess um, probably a question for me. Um, it, it's you know it, it really depends on the photograph. So you know if, if it's a photograph, for example, let's say from the 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 war of independence or maybe the 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 rising that time. You know you're you're looking for typically there's going to be some kind of soldiers or rebels or somebody in the photograph, and you're trying to find out the types of colors of clothes that they would have worn. So you know maybe as as you saw during the uh, during our our talk through the photographs. That picture you remember of the the British soldier being carried, you're trying to find out what kind of you know uniforms they wore, what shade of green there was a type of khaki green, what color buttons and so on. Um, and then again, it, it depends on what else is in the picture. Is there a known person where you can find out maybe their eye color or hair color? That could be from paintings. It could be from records, as I mentioned, from like the Ellis Island records. Um, it could be from prison records. Um, and um, uh, and otherwise, you know, you, you're looking to see what kind of features in the photograph. So, for example, uh, one thing I mentioned recently is that a lot of the colors in, in the photographs of roofs in Ireland, um, initially when I run them through, we use an AI program called the Oldify. When I use that, they often come out a kind of a brownish color, reddish color, because that would be the most common color of, of roofs around the world. But, of course, we know that in Ireland, not all, but the majority of roofs would be kind of grayish slate uh, tiles. Um, or slates as we call them. So you, you would try and you know fine tune the colors for that. So it really, it really depends on the image. Sometimes you have, you, you're you looking at, I suppose, common clothes colors worn at a particular point in time. Um, we have this reference point, which is dress in Ireland, where you know it has records of different uh, dress colors uh, throughout the ages. And then um, I think, as I mentioned as well, in the National Folklore Collection, when I was talking about that picture from, from Cara Rowe, there are either text records, textual records of types of colors of clothes, or there will be actually even paintings or hand drawings of clothes with actual, you can see colors from, from the time. In some areas, the variation will be uh, lower, like in the Iron Islands and so on, they would view certain types of dyes, which would have come from, you know, certain types of seaweed or, or lichens or, or, you know, barks and so on. So the palette will be fairly restricted, but also um, then as you go into the cities, there will be probably more variation. So, it really depends on, on the type of photograph. But we try and do as much research as possible to find out either um, known colors or typical colors and then work from that. Thanks for that, John. So the next question is for Dr. Connolly. And then um, perhaps, Matt, um, you can also add a little bit at the end. The question is, is was, made, was Portland a major port for immigration, or did immigrants arrive from Boston, Canada, and other places around the country? Yes, I'm very happy to try to answer that question. And before I do, I wanted to say a special hello to Sarah Ann. I've never 
spoken with her before, so it's great to get to meet her and, and the Buckley at that, very happy. And also, uh, John, I wanted to say I'm very jealous of that image behind you of Galway Bay looking over toward Galway County and Kusharaga. I know that area pretty well because I've spent some time in Listunduana and would oh. always take the coast road because it was so much more beautiful. So uh, oh, lovely. it's a lovely yeah, background. Well, it's, it's, it, uh, it, you know, for those who have been to Ireland, it's of course the burn. You know, I, I was up for a walk around that area earlier on and uh, I was talking about the ABC. So the A is the Iron Islands, the B is the burn and the C is Connemara. And, you know, from a particular point here, you can kind of see all three of them. But um, I went to school actually in Liston Burn myself. So it's um, my, my mother's side of the family is from this region. So, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful part of the country. And I think, fortunately, we have a nice sunny day here where you can see it at, at its best. It looks great from here. And uh, I will avoid the political question of um, to whom do the Aran Islands belong to rightfully, County Clare or County Galway. I'll avoid that altogether. <laughs> so um, sure. let, let me try to answer the question that was put to me. Was Portland a major port for immigration or did they all arrive from Boston and Canada? The vast majority of them would have come uh, up from Boston or in some cases, New York, or as Matt was saying earlier, uh, down from Canada, they were called the two boaters. They would go over to Canada on one boat and then down uh, to Portland or other in Boston or other American cities on a second boat, so the two boaters. Uh, Portland was a, an immigration center for a short period of time in the 1920s, early 1920s, when immigration stations in, in New York and Boston were uh, overwhelmed with people. And there's a small little island out in Casco Bay, which you can see clearly from my house, called House Island, that was actually a quarantine station so anybody that had any visible sickness or that had to be looked at from a medical point of view could be quarantined there. But then those that were in good physical condition would go on into Portland where they could have a, an instant connection either by ship or by rail to go to the other cities to the south or to the west. Um, that was their, their um, destination. So the answer was yes, but it was not a major port of immigration. And I don't know if Matt wanted to add to that. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. It's, it's great to meet uh, Professor Breslin here and Dr. Buckley. Um, uh, yeah, it's a great, beautiful view there. I, uh, my great-grandmother was from County Clare, and uh, so I spent a lot of time in Clare. And, and I have great-great-grandparents from Galway, so I, uh, that whole area is, you know, you know, very uh, special to me. Anyways, uh, yeah. So the question. Uh, Oh, and I also have Cork ancestry, so I get that in there. But uh, <laughs> I, turned, I turned twenty. I turned twenty years old in Cork City. Well, I actually woke up in Dublin and, and ended up that night in Cork City. So uh, that sounds yeah, like so a typical night. <laughs> yeah, typical. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, a lot of the immigrants into Portland uh, came. They came from Boston and New York and, and Halifax and uh, St. Andrews and St. John's, New Brunswick. And, and into Montreal on my father's side, I had a great grand, great, great grandfather, uh, Burke from Galway, who uh, went to Montreal. And then he brought, then uh, a year later, his wife and children came over, but they came into Boston and then met him up here in Portland. Uh, but the, the uh, steamship started coming in uh, from Canada into Portland in the late 1840s. And we have passenger lists for those ships at the Maine Historical Society. And then beginning in the 1850s, these uh, steamships from Liverpool came directly into Portland. Uh, and we have a lot of those passenger lists. And a lot of that's also on Ancestry.com. But ironically, a lot of these immigrants that were coming off the boat in the 1850s and 1860s and 70s, uh, and a lot of them are from Galway, uh, they, they kept moving on to Boston, New York, as Mike mentioned, uh, that they didn't stay here in Portland. But we don't know just how many stayed in Portland. Uh, and then in the 1880s, we have a, a, a beautiful painting that I forget Mike might know the um, the artist of, of immigrants coming off a boat on Commercial Street near the India the uh, near India Street near the Grand Trunk Depot. In the 18, you know, it was a steamship uh, get immigrants coming right off the boat on into Portland. Uh, so yes, and then. Uh, 
so there were ships that came right into Portland, you know, from, you know, especially uh, beginning in the 1880s, a huge influx from uh, Galway. Uh, and thanks. as Mike said, House Island. Yep. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. Thank um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we have a question from Charlotte B. And she asks, uh, John, I think you're probably the right one for this. Any advice for colorization for non-professionals? Um, yeah, so my, I suppose it depends how much you want to do, you know, if you're doing family photographs and so on. So I, I use a service called um, uh, My Heritage in Color, which is, you know, it's, it's a paid service. It's a genealogy website. And um, for a flat fee, you can kind of colorize the main photographs as you want to. I think you can try out about five to 10 there for free to get the feel for it, I suppose. Um, there's another good um, service called Colorize Images. It's, you know, I can't remember. It's very cheap. You 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 pay eight or ten euro, and you can do as many as you want to. It's it's uh, there's an app, but it's also a website. Um, I, I have done a video on a free service, which is based on the same system called Deoldify. And if you look for a Deoldify tutorial, you'll find that if you want to try it out. It's a bit more. Um, uh, there's a bit more steps involved with, with the the first ones I've mentioned. You basically drag and drop a photograph onto your web browser, and it colorizes instantly. Um, the other one, you have to go through a number of steps to, to colorize it. So, you know, th there's a couple of options there. Um, there, but you can also use things like Photoshop. You can colorize manually, and you know, you can, you know, for example, let's say it's a family photograph you want, and you know, for example, your grandmother's eye color, hair color, you can manually um, you know, tweak tweak using that. So, I think the first step will be use one of the kind of the the free the the free or paid services. Um, you know, Deoldify, My Heritage in Color, or Colorize Images. And there's apps for all of these on on various phones. Just you know, you can try it, try them out for free and and see see if they're if, if they're if, if they work. And otherwise, um, you can go more advanced and use things like Photoshop to to do more. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh, there are a few questions about whether or not you two have met yet. Uh, when you're going to meet? When you're going to come to Portland, Maine? Uh, what the genesis of the book was? If you've never met, maybe you can sort of address all of those. <laughs> Sure. This is, it's very unusual that we haven't met. Obviously, we work in the same university, but um, I think, uh, uh, as Mike had pointed out, disciplines kind of are, are are separate, but universities are trying to bring us together. So we happen to meet online during COVID. So, John, we do have to set that up, really. Like, I live in Clare, and I'll be moving back to Galway. So I actually live in a, an old RIC barracks in Clare at the moment. Um, so we're very much Clare Galway based. Um, but I know, John, we really will probably have to record this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Um, and, you know, I, I, funnily enough, somebody recorded a video of my seven Sarah Ann for the Irish Times recently. And um, I gave this person because he, he came to visit me in Galway and then he was going down to Clare to meet Sarah and I gave him a, and it was all socially distanced and all the correct procedures, but I gave him a signed copy of the book and I said, if you bring this now to Sarah Ann, you'll actually be the first person to have a copy that's been signed by two people because, um, you know, we, we've never been in, in the same place together. So um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's been it's been kind of weird. So yeah, we, we connected in, I think it was March last year and um, I, you know, I, I'd, um, I, I'd seen the, the book I don't think I actually got it at that stage, but seeing the book, The Color of Time by um, Dan Jones and Marina Amaral. And, you know, that, that's, I think that combination, as Mike mentioned, of different disciplines, you know, myself and Sarah and have worked really well together coming from different backgrounds, working on the book. And um, yeah, so it was all over email, all over, all over Zoom. And we also haven't met any of our, you know, publishing team, uh, our publicists, our marketing people. It's all been through Zoom calls. So it's been a very, unusual experience but also very good i think we, we've worked uh, extremely well and um i suppose just goes show what, what can be done through through the power of, of remote and um, there's been no book launches or no in-person book launches um i think about the most exciting thing i've done is gone to my local bookshop and signed a few copies um so maybe uh, we'll have a belated one in, in the future <laughs> um so yeah it, well when I, once i get vaccinated so I'm I'm waiting for my age cohort to be called upon. Yeah, I just got my first vaccine on Monday, so hopefully before too long we'll we'll all be uh, uh, again. That's great news. I know there's a lot of people that are itching to visit Ireland from the U.S. again. Um, so Sarah, and again for you. Um, 
you mentioned that there are 178 photos in the book. How did you select the ones you showed today? And then we have uh, what Patrick O'Brien has posed as an impossible question, perhaps. How many hours went into researching the photos for the book, finding the background on them, the IDs, the colors, the history? I think they're probably sort of connected, those two questions. It's a really great question. Um, I suppose John was running and is still running the Old Ireland and Colour project. So the Instagram, the Twitter, the social media account. John had an amazing selection already of photographs. So it became about what are the themes in, you know, Irish, particularly social, political history that we wanted to highlight. And we really wanted to frame the book thematically. So we basically ended up really coming down, John, didn't we? So we we would have like a very large collection. And it was just so hard to cut. But we we worked a lot with our publisher. Like it's it's an unusual relationship in a way we really did work through the book with them um, and I think that was great um, I have my interests I'm a historian of childhood youth and and gender so there is a section on women and children and I'm a social historian so that probably comes through as well but we were also very conscious of the importance of the Irish abroad and the importance of the Irish revolution recently so we chose the photographs thematically, but we were choosing right up until the final manuscript, really, John, weren't we? Like there was yeah, plenty yeah. that didn't make it in. Yeah, one, I remember one photograph, uh, our publisher said it'd be great to include this one. And we did it, you know, basically a few days before we were <laughs> good to go. So it was it was happening right until the end. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I suppose I, I'd colorize a lot of pictures you know, prior to, as I say, we, we met in March, but, you know, the kind of selection and Sarah Ann's um, work on the captions and historical backgrounds, that all happened in about five months because we were, you know, finished um, obviously a month or two before the book would have been in, in, in physical form originally. So it was quite a lot of intensive work over that kind of summer of last year, but then you know, we were all in lockdown, so I suppose we had a bit more um, time to, to, to do this. And, um, I think maybe on the old Ireland color project at that stage, we might have had maybe three to 500 pictures kind of in, in the pot, but we would have colorized a lot more for, for the book. So in terms of how long it takes, you know, a picture can take a few hours or it could take a few days, depending on how much detail is in it. So, you know, if there's ones with lots of crowds and faces and people, um, mm -hmm. although I'm using some AI tools, there's a lot of manual intervention that goes in after that. So it, it, it takes some time, but um, yeah, it, it, it came together. Mm -hmm. Great, and thanks. I guess in regards to the research, it, like John says, it depends on the photograph. So how much time it will take, basically. Great, thanks for that. Now, I owe an apology to Patricia O'Brien. There was a microphone cord in the front of my screen, and I thought it was Patrick. But I've shifted the cord, and I know it's Patricia now. So apologies for that. Um, there was a person who asked if there was text available explaining the photographs and um, the obvious answer for that I think is that we've got the book and that's available. Um, any main Irish Heritage member can buy it for 20% off right on our website. So there's that. Are there any other companion pieces or um, additional resources that go along with the book or is it, is it uh, the book at this point? Like, I guess one thing I'd say about if it's further research, if it's into biographies, as I mentioned, the Dictionary of Irish Biography is, is fully online now. So any personality that was significant in Ireland is covered under that. Um, I would recommend for the revolution, the Atlas of the Irish Revolution, but I would recommend as well um, the, the Cambridge Histories of Ireland. So we have the social history of Ireland and then the four volume Cambridge histories. These are just if there's some that we would have, con, you know, used them. But for each photograph, we were consulting a number of, of references. Um, and we also have access to a lot of digital archives, um, you know, be, through our the university. So paid subscriptions to all the newspapers to, you know, uh, we would use the parliamentary deba debates at times. So um it would depend on the photograph but there are kind of some general suggestions i'd make of things that would be available 
That's great. Thanks very much. So that pretty much wraps up the questions that we have. I'm just wondering if there's anything that each one of you would like to say in closing, or if you have a question for each other. Um, we just can have a quick little round robin if you want, and then we will um, finish up for the day. It's really been um, wonderful, and we appreciate um, your participation and the fact that you've written the book and found all those photos in the first place. So thank you. Thanks, Jean. And I'll just say for each of the photographs, you know, at the back of the book, we have references to all of the original sources and also the identifier for each photograph. So anybody can, you know, a lot of them are online, so you can type it in, type in the identifier, find more information about it. You often will find more contact as well. But, you know, the, the book itself has um, all, I think, um, the, the, the key information on, on each photograph that we could find from, you know, the historical context, from the people in it, from, you know, as I said, different colors and so on, and, and, and choice of colors. So, but anyway, it's been really a pleasure just to to chat about them about us today, to meet and talk with uh, Mike and, and Matt and here again some context and the links from from, uh, from over here to over there, and yeah, it's it's it, it, it's been a fun day. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, ju just to say thanks, um, and also to say like it's fantastic the work you're doing and to see the. I suppose, as both Matt and, and Mike have done, the more complicated history of Irish immigration from the 18th century. It's just great to to hear it and that you have the genealogist service is amazing. Um, and just thanks to you, Jean, for all the work as well. Thank you, Jean. And we do hope to visit as soon as we uh, as soon as we can. That, that related uh, book tour, I think, of the world is is coming up. So. Uh, myself and Sarah, and ask me first, of course, um, and uh, <laughs> and do that. But after afterwards, we, we'll we'll do the world tour and hopefully come to visit. Well, I think one of the reasons there are so many Irish immigrants in Portland is it because it is like the first American city from Galway um, when you get on a boat. So we would like to be your first stop too. So, um, did you have anything you wanted to add, Matt or or Mike, before we wrap up? Well, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to everybody. Thanks, Gene, and uh, it's great to meet everybody uh, today. Uh, behind me is uh, uh, St. Dominic's, uh, the sanctuary, the main Irish Harris Center. And uh, this, this church was built between 1888 and 1892. And uh, there was a church on this site from eight, the first church was built in 1828. And uh, Mike, as Mike mentioned, it was named for St. Dominic, uh, the, the, the founder of the Dominican order of which Father Charles French was a, uh, a member and Father Chen, uh, Father French was from Galway City. His father was a Protestant warden of Galway. And uh, so that's where the, the Galway connection begins in 1828 with Portland. Uh, there were few and far Galway immigrants themselves from besides him until the 1840s. But, uh, but anyway, I think, Mike, uh, we have so many great photographs. So I think we'll have to get together, all, some of us, and uh, start colorizing the, the Portland Irish photographs. <laughs> we, we have like a couple hundred black and white photographs. Unfortunately, a lot are uh, uh, not identified, but we hope, you know, eventually to identify them. So uh, it's a, just another project to work on. <laughs> yeah, there's so many things to do, but you know, you, you see a lot of and libraries that, yeah. share their, their photographs on Flickr and just getting suddenly, it seems to unlock something. Somebody sees it and says, oh, I know what that is. And uh, it's really fantastic when you kind of, it's that kind of crowdsourcing thing, but when you can open them up and and get get some feedback from others, hopefully. I guess I get to say have the last word today, and and I feel honored uh, to be able to do that. I have something in common with John and Sarah Ann, in that I was also working on my first historical novel during this pandemic, and it has also just come out. So I brought the first copies here to the Maine Irish Heritage Center today. And I know that Matt's working on other works too. So uh, congratulate, oh, there it is. Congratulations to you all. Congratulations. I just congratulations wanted to say, to my, my. thank you. I just wanted to say to Sarah Ann, it's great to hear your voice for the first time and uh, great to meet you. And to John, we've talked before on the telephone. I wanted to say it's great to see the sun shining on the great people of Fenor County Clare. And I hope it continues that way for a long time. All the best to you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Matt, Sarah, and thank you, and Jean. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks, John, Sarah, Ann. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Have a good afternoon right, or evening. Thanks very much. Thanks,